good to see you, Anna. So good to see you. Great to have you guys here. Uh, hey, Brian, how are you? Great to meet you. Great to have you guys here. Well, good morning, everyone. So glad for you to join us. This is always an interesting Sunday, the Sunday right after Canada Day, because there are so many who, who choose to travel other places, or they choose to go see fireworks at 11 o'clock at night. And with parking and the polite, politeness of drivers here in Canada, it takes quite a few hours to get home, does it not? Anybody, anybody downtown yesterday? Is there anybody who would just be bold enough to confess this morning that yesterday as you were trying to leave downtown that you may have lost your Christianity? Is there anybody here this morning? We're here to pray for you. <laughs> well, we are thankful that you've joined us today, and we, we want to take a moment in our service to celebrate this great country. Friends, I, I want you, before we get into any of the preliminaries, I, I want you to know, and I know you do know this, but I just want to remind you, we, sir, we live in a great country. This is, this is a wonderful place. Yeah. And I was watching some live feeds yesterday and saw people making comments that were negative. And I thought, man, we just need to celebrate the great country we live in. Thank God for all the benefits. It's not a perfect country, but it sure is a great country. And we want to celebrate the 150 years that we have, uh, have as a nation. And so what's going to take place is we're going to watch a video right now just giving an overview of Canada. It lasts for about four to five minutes. And then as soon as the video is done, I'm going to ask that you would stand up. And we, it's great to have the Gloucester uh, band here, the trombone section. Gordon Woods has arranged this. And they're going, to, they're going to lead us in O Canada. So right after the video, I'll ask everybody to stand. And they're going to lead us in O Canada. And then following that, we have uh, three individuals who will be praying for Canada. We've broken Canada into three sections. And they're going to pray for each of the sections of Canada. And then I will conclude. So after O Canada, you may be seated. And then we'll go into our prayer for this celebration of Canada. Canada's 150th. Let's watch the video this morning. Canada is one of the greatest countries in the world. It means the world to me. I believe it's a very great country. To me, it's the best country that there is, and I'm happy to live there. To me, Canada is a land of freedom. I love that it is a democratic country, and that it gives opportunities to people to achieve, meet their goals, and be who they want to be. Canada means to me a safe, strong place. Freedom, safety, security. Freedom, equality, and peace. Canada means a place of freedom where we can serve God without fear. Canada is a place of safety. Canada was not created by Canadians. It was created by immigrants. And I think that we live today as a very diverse society. My native land, I'm First Nation. Uh, I'm very happy and thankfully to be on 150 years to celebrate Canada Day. I'm very thankful and very happy. Uh, we, as immigrants to Canada, who've been here 15 years, uh, Pam and I see this as the land of opportunity, a land where... Uh, we can live to our full potential. And uh, raise kids in an environment that is conducive to uh, to, to them to live to their full potential. Exactly. <laughs> I couldn't have said it better. <laughs> G 
Canada is a place not only of opportunity, but it's a place where there's tolerance, compassion. It is a place of security. Canada, to me, means peace, love and inclusiveness. Very safe country, it's very secure and it's very peaceful. Somewhere where you can go to have a better life. A place where everyone's kind, gentle and everyone gets along. Je suis content pour la célébration de la 150e anniversaire du Canada. Comme Canadien, je suis fier de, de cette célébration. Merci. We have many benefits and access to free health care and secondary school. Celebrating uh, the rich history in Canada and it makes me very proud to be here. I've traveled a little bit to Asia and even as far away as Australia and South Africa for a brief period of time. And it's the most exciting thing to me to go to the airport and know that I'm getting back on an airplane that's got a Canadian flag on it because I'm going home. Canada is home to me. It's where the beavers are. But people are very loving and they're caring. Beautiful country. Maple syrup. And even though I find the winters harsh, it really is a wonderful place to live. Tipskin in Tish, Canada. Pretty much Canada, Dinak. Salo Kurunziza, Ya Canada, Yimaka, Ijana, Milontano. Bon fate, Canada. Canada, gefeliciteerd met 150 jaar. Oi, Canada, Malgayan, Karawan, Senyo, Mabuhai. Canada, Nutia, Imbadavad, Prandanal, Waltekal. I'm proud to be a Canadian and I hope to see many more years of Canada being a prosperous country. My prayer is that it will become more God-focused and look towards God for its help. looking for Averlyn. Averlyn, are you here? We're going to go from BC with John, Central Canada with Pastor Adam, to the Maritimes with Averlyn.
Here you go, John. Be Sir. Seated. Sir, let's just get that on. Be seated. Is this on? There we go. But it's okay. I'm from Saskatchewan, right? Okay. All right. All right. Let's pray for the West. Heavenly Father, Lord, we want to come before you today as a community, Lord, and lift up Western Canada. Uh, Lord, we want to thank you for that land, for the landscapes and the mountains and the skies, Lord, and the fields. And Lord, for the people who, who care for their neighbors and who tend the land, Lord, and steward it. And Lord, I just want to lift up friends and family and all of the people we know. And uh, Lord, I want to lift up the, the leadership in that land right now, Lord, in the West. I want to pray for the premiers and for the mayors, Lord, and for the pastors. And Lord, I just pray that you would give them wisdom as they lead and guide their thoughts, guide their actions, Lord, and keep that land prosperous and, and pointed towards you. Uh, Lord, we also, in today's world, Lord, we want to pray for, we want to pray for your provision, for all that's going on, Lord, in the West with the economy and with lost jobs and lost economic opportunities, Lord. We just want to pray that your hand would be upon that land, that you would provide for people's needs, and Lord, specifically, that you would that you would embolden the churches there to reach out, Lord, and to be that focal point for their communities, to look out for their neighbors, to look out for those who have, who have come upon hard times, and that, Lord, that your, your hands would be there through those churches, that you would be there through those churches and through those people, through our brothers and sisters there. And, Lord, we just, we just want to pray also, Lord, for boldness for the Christians there in a, in a world where it's increasingly, Lord, harder to, to speak about you and, and to, be, to be heard, Lord. We just pray that you would give them boldness to let their light shine in their schools and in their jobs and their homes. And Lord, I just pray that you would just bless that land, bless those people, Lord. And we thank you so much for them, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, we pray this morning for Manitoba and for the Northwest Territories, for Nunavut and for Ontario and for Quebec. Father, we know that um, in the center part of Canada, God, you have a desire to move and impact the center of Canada that would spread to the rest of Canada. So, Father, we pray for the leadership, Lord, in each one of these provinces and territories, that, God, you would move and that you would speak to their hearts. That, Father, I pray that as the churches are praying for the leadership of their province, that, God, hearts will be transformed, lives will be transformed. Father, we pray that as they make decisions on behalf of their province and, and, and their location, God, I pray that the decisions that they make, God, would, would honor you, that God would see you glorified, would see you lifted up. Father, we pray for the needs that are represented all throughout these provinces, God, that you would begin to meet those needs. I pray that your church would rise up, that your church would be your hands and be your feet in these places, oh God. I pray that you would be seen, that you'd be revealed to all of those people. God, you see the different cultures that are represented throughout central Canada. Father, we're thankful that we live in a country and, and that, that is so well represented from around the world. And so I pray that each person that would find themselves in any one of these provinces, God, they'd feel welcome, they'd feel at home, they'd be able to call this place their home. That, God, they'd be able to find success in, in, in jobs with their families, oh Lord. God, we pray again for provision for each, each person that would call these places home. God, would you be so well represented by your churches in these parts of Canada. And Father, we pray for Quebec this morning. Dieu, nous prions pour le Québec ce matin comme une province qui serait considérée comme loin de vous. Nous savons que vous n'êtes pas de loin du Québec. Vous avez un amour et une passion pour les Québécois. Père, je prie pour les églises qui sont établies au Québec, qu'elles auront des portes ouvertes avec l'Évangile. Cela, il verrait une augmentation des gens dire oui à une relation avec vous. Seigneur, seriez-vous révélé au Québec afin que les Québécois puissent vous recevoir? Almighty God and Heavenly Father, thank you for this vast country of Canada that extends from ocean to ocean. You have blessed us, and you have blessed us in Atlantic Canada, that is New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and Newfoundland and Labrador in many ways, with industrious people, with a region of several lakes and rivers and natural resources, Father, and we thank you for it. Fill our hearts with thankfulness, and may we always be mindful of your favor and be glad to do your will. Help us to manage your provision well. Grant that we share the fruits of the earth and rejoice in your goodness. We pray that the resources will continue to yield prosperity for all of us and will be well managed and protected. 
Give us wisdom to use the natural resources you have given us so that future generations may continue to praise you for your bountiful provision through Jesus Christ, O oh Lord. We pray for all our leaders in Atlantic Canada. We pray for the premiers of the four provinces, Brian Gallant, Premier of New Brunswick, Stephen McNeil, Premier of Nova Scotia, Wade McLachlan, Premier of, New of Prince Edward Island, and Dwight Ball, Premier of Newfoundland and Labrador, and their members of parliament, cabinets, and offices of political and bureaucratic staff, that they may govern well and lead and direct their provincial governments with wisdom from you, O Lord. Guide them to do what is right, <clears throat> that they may execute good judgment as they make decisions regarding education and health care and the environment and, and administration of justice and local government. Give them strength to know and do your will. Fill them with the love of truth and righteousness and make them mindful of their calling to serve in the fear of God. It says in your word, many are the plans of the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will be established. May God's purpose work through these leaders and may the godly flourish and may abundant prosperity reign. We also remember the 32 members of parliament that represent these eastern provinces and foremost the prime minister. Uh, we pray, dear God, that you will endow these leaders and foremost the Prime Minister of Canada with your justice and with your righteousness so that you may work your purpose through them. You said in your word, the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. So we ask you today, Father, that you use the Prime Minister and these members of Parliament that are representing the Atlantic provinces to fulfill your purposes. Guide and bless them that they may enact laws that are pleasing to you and that will glorify your name. Help them to defend the poor and those who are at the margins, but who are precious in your sight. Help the leaders govern well, dear God, and spread the good news of Jesus Christ, which will bear fruit for the salvation of people and for your glory. And Father, give them the will and strength to work for justice and to see those who are left behind or forgotten be given the opportunities to develop fully and in both mind and body. We also pray for those who are involved in local government, for the mayors, the deputy mayors, the town councillors, other town council members, wardens in cities, towns, and municipalities, that they handle the community issues, Father, with strategic wisdom. Grant them grace as they exercise their duties. The word says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. Father God, we pray for wisdom for these leaders. We pray for peace and prosperity of all the cities, towns, and villages in these Atlantic provinces, because if, it, if they prosper, we too will prosper. We also pray that those who walk in darkness shall see the light, and God's light shall shine in darkness. We thank you for blessing Atlantic Canada with a diversity of peoples from New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and Newfoundland and Labrador, such as the Maliset, the Mi'kmaq, descendants of those who escaped to Canada via the Underground Railroad, descendants of the Black Loyalists, the Acadians, Anglophone immigrants, and other past immigrants, and recent immigrants from around the world. We acknowledge their many contributions, Father, and we pray that they all live in peace and harmony. We pray that you pour out your love upon all the people of the Atlantic Canada, and Canada too, that they live in peace and harmony among each other, and will willingly come to accept you as their heavenly Lord, that they will serve you and obey you. We remember those right now who are employed and those who lack work and have great need. We pray that you would guide people in the region to use the public and private wealth, that all may find employment and receive just payment for their labor in Jesus' name. Father, give us an understanding heart and teach us to rely on your strength and to accept the responsibilities as citizens to make wise decisions for the well-being of our society. Lord, may you be exalted in all our undertakings and may your Holy Spirit move people's hearts to dispel hatred for one another, to dissipate suspicion, to heal divisions that we may live in justice peace, tolerance, and harmony through Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
we know that all the people of New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and Newfoundland and Labrador, we pray that they would come to a knowledge of truth in Christ and be filled with the glory of the knowledge of God as the waters cover the sea. We need you, Father, to be our moral and spiritual compass in these times. And as Canada celebrates its 150th birthday, we pray that there would be greater celebrations for many people who come to know you, O God, through Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Can we stand this morning? We know that our, our country needs Jesus, don't we? Come on, I said, I know we know that our, our country needs Jesus. That we could have all the systems in place. We could have the best leaders. We could have the best resources. But if, if Jesus is left out, come on, we're lost. So this morning, what I want to do is I want to call upon the name of the Lord. I want to call on him and we, we seek him and we beckon him. Amen. As morning dawns and evening fades, you inspire songs of praise. There rise from earth to touch your heart and glorify your name. Come on, sing it out, your name. this land that we live in, this land of Canada, Lord, from east to west to north and south. Lord, we thank you for this beautiful place that we can look out and we can see your beauty. Lord, we don't have to look far to see who you are, but God, you, we need you to move in this land. Lord, we are thankful for what you've done in the past, but as Pastor Jeff said last week, if you've done it before, you can do it again, and I believe that you can do a mighty work in the land of Canada. So we call out to you this morning, Lord, have your way. Lord, do what you need to do. Lord, we want to be the vessels that you work through. So we come to you this morning and we're, Lord, we lift up Canada and we know that nothing else can save Canada but the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you and we celebrate 
for what is going to happen in this beautiful land. We thank you, Jesus. And all of community said a big loud. Come on, we can do better than that. All of community said. Amen. amen, amen. Why don't you grab a seat this morning? Oh, we should probably do an offering. Right, Pastor Jeff? <laughs> I got wrapped up there. <laughs> Ushers, you're already here. What we're going to do this morning, if, you've, if you have your ties and offerings together, we're, uh, we're going to ask the ushers to go ahead, and we're going to watch the announcement videos. All right, man. <laughs> Good morning, and welcome to Community. If you're our guest today, we are so glad to have you with us, and we'd love to connect with you, and we have two ways to do so. One way is the community card, which is located right in the seat in front of you. The second would be to text welcome to the number at the bottom of the screen. At the end of the service, we'll have a free gift for you at the Welcome Center. Now check out today's announcements. Come on in. Hello, sir. Well, 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 look who's back. I was wondering if you were still looking for volunteers for kids camps at CPC. I sure am. Do you know anyone? Well, I could help. Really, Jeff? Really? I sure can. Really? I guess so. Really? I have so, so much to offer. That felt so good, Jeffrey. So I would like to help with both camps if that's okay. I know Heart Camp is from July 10th to 14th, and VBS is from August 14th to 18th. Did someone say, Heart Camp? Not a good time, Steve. Shoo, shoo. Gotta go, gotta go, gotta go. Worship pastors. Super, and you know you can choose which area you can help out in, right? Sure do. I'm so excited to get started. Easy, Tiger. You know we have some training meetings to do first. Yeah, I, I hear that after I register as a leader, all the dates for the meetings are available online. That's correct. So does this mean that now I'm your volunteer? I suppose. Just sign every page in this policy manual. All of this? <laughs> Next! Whoa, baby! Oh no! Hey, it's July 2nd, and many of you are going to be going on holidays this summer, and I want just to give you a financial update before you headed out on vacation. As of this very moment, we are $8,441.76 behind our budget. Now that might seem alarming at the beginning to be behind budget, but we are actually only $2,000 off of where we were last year, and last year was a financial record for us. We have been managing our expenses in such a great way that we are in a healthy place, but I do want you to know that we're just a little bit shy of where we should be for our general fund. We're also behind in our missions giving about $5,000. Once again, this is pretty normal. We usually get the remaining monies for missions during our missions campaign. Mention. The reason why I'm sharing this for you is I just want to encourage you to continue to find ways to give during the summer, whether it's talking to Pastor Sheila, making a uh, deposit early in the summer, using PayPal, or maybe even giving some pre-data checks. We're just asking that you would continue to give this summer to help us with our operational budget. Thank you so much. I want to briefly update you on where we're at with our mortgage. If you look at the whiteboard, you can see that in Jul as of July 1st, which was yesterday, Canada Day, we had $54,439.77 left in our mortgage. We made a special contribution of $15,000 in May. And so we are so close to paying this off. If we were just to follow our normal giving towards our mortgage, by June 15, 2018, we'll have our mortgage completely paid off. However, April 8th marks our 40th anniversary, actually April 9th, but we'll be celebrating it on the 8th of April next year. And on that date, we are scheduled to have $10,000 remaining in our mortgage, $10,647.53.
Friends, we want to pay that off before we get to our 40th anniversary. Only $10,000 is needed to go above and beyond. And so we're asking you to think about what you can do to help us achieve that goal. We'd love to pay it off by the end of this year. We really believe we can do that. And then as we go into 2018, we can burn our mortgage and begin to think about what God has for this building and the ministries in this building for the future. Would you consider giving above and beyond to our mortgage to help us clear the debt? Hey CPC, happy Canada Day. I just want to let you know what the item of the month is for July. July, it's clothing, such as sweaters, t-shirts, shorts, <laughs> sneakers, and don't forget your toque, eh? Boys and girls, right now, if you're in JK, SK, grades one, two, three, four, five, I want you to actually look at the back of the room right now. See that guy waving his arms? It's me. I want you to run back there, go catch him, and meet him in the gym, all right? Go now. Well, friends, just before we get started, we're about to start a brand new series. I just want to share just a couple things. It's good to have Marvin and Anna Enos from Chiang Mai. They run a Bible college, and we're glad to have you in our service this morning. Would you just wave at the congregation? <laughs> Chiang Mai, Thailand, and they're... <clears throat> I had the opportunity to be with them uh, on the first Monday that we were in Chiang Mai and got, got to see all that God was doing through their lives, and so it's just a blessing to have you here this morning. I had someone come to me uh, right near the end of our, of our Canada Day moment and just reminded me of the importance of praying for the reconciliation between our First Nations and the rest of the country. I wish I could tell you that I understand all the dynamics, but I don't. But I would encourage you not just to pray for each of our provinces and our territories, but would you pray for the long-term health and unity within this nation, that there would be reconciliation, complete healing, and that God would move this country forward in the plans that he has for us. We are about to start this brand new series. It's called CORE, and, uh, and this series is based upon nine value statements that we call our ethos here at CPC, and so we're going to spend the summer looking at those nine things. We'll tell you a little bit about who we are and tell you a little bit about where we're going as a church, how we operate, why we say yes to certain things, why we say no to certain things, why we do certain things, and, uh, and it's not just about what takes place here on Sunday, but it's really what we want to see as the values within the church body, the body of Christ. And so we're going to begin this morning looking at the very first mes message called Complete Alignment. I, I don't know about you, but I love the smell of a new car. Any, anybody, anybody with me? I love the smell of a new I've never had a new car, but I enjoy the smell of a new car. I've had a newer car, a car that's new to me, but not brand new. But there's something so special about a new car. You get in and you smell every material, the leather, the, 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 the dashboard, the carpet. It smells so good. It's completely clean. There, there is no dirt or salt from the winter. The, the, everything works proper. There's no rust on the side of the car. The car drives smoothly. It starts properly. It, 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 it's just incredible. It's so perfect. I remember in, in 1996, we had got a newer van, and, and I was so excited. It was, it was very much like the conditions that I had just described. It smelled great, looked great, drove so well. And in January of 1997, I was driving down to some, some sectional meetings uh, for our youth pastors across our district, and it was the beginning of the ice storm that day. I was only doing about 40, 50 kilometers an hour going down, uh, highway, uh, going down the highway, Highway 30, no, it's not 35, anyway, Highway 41, going down Highway 41, and I, and I thought I was being very sensible because I had seen cars go off in the ditch. And, and, and I just figured they were just driving too fast. They didn't understand Canadian weather. And then all of a sudden, I hit some black ice, and my brand new to me, my brand new car began to spin around, and I went flying into a snowbank. Now, at first, I was quite concerned. I mean, I had only had this vehicle for one month. Everything was perfect. And, and I was concerned that the front end was going to be damaged and that there was going to be all kinds of problems and that this perfect vehicle was going to be messed up. 
And so a tow truck came by. They had been sitting on the side of the road because they knew that there was going to be problems that day. And this tow truck came by and pulled me out and took me just a couple kilometers down the road. And he looked and he said, hey, everything's fine with your vehicle. I, I didn't believe him. I looked around my vehicle. There wasn't a scratch. There wasn't a bump. I mean, everything, everything seemed completely fine. No, no dents. It was just perfect. I thought, this is incredible. And then he said these words. He said, but you're going to need an alignment. Now, I didn't know what an alignment was. I mean, I had heard about it. I kind of understood it a, a tiny bit, but I'm not very mechanical. And so I thought, okay, that's, that's no big deal. Alignment. Yeah, that's a biggie. We, we can do that at any point. And so I drove down to Belleville. I, I started to notice over the next few weeks as I didn't get my alignment that the drive went from this to this. I, I, there would be moments where, where I would like I, I would go to change the radio or, or, or change the tape back in those days. I'd change the cassette in, in the tape player and, and all of a sudden, instead of holding the, the steering wheel, expecting it to go straight, the car started to veer over to the side. And the more I let the, the misalignment go, the harder it became to keep on track. I found myself fighting with the steering wheel as the car kept on heading over to the left. It kept going where I didn't want to go. I wanted to go straight, but it wanted of its own volition to go to the left. Anybody who's had a misalignment in their car knows exactly what I'm talking about. It's interesting how that picture can describe us in Christianity. You see, God's got a plan for our lives that we would go in a certain path that is destined towards the best things he has for our life. He has this plan for us that causes us to go forward into the paths that he prepared for us before we ever entered planet Earth. But every now and then, society comes along and bumps us. Every now and then, we get pulled over to the side, and we get out of alignment. And there are times in our lives, times in our Christianity, where we're going on God's path, but we feel the tug over to the left or to the right. Anybody ever felt that before? These little tugs to the left or to the right. And I watched over the years of my life, as Christians who were once on God's path, found themselves veering to the left or veering to the right and going into places that God never designed them for simply because they are out of alignment. They're out of alignment. That's why it's important, friends, that we constantly are in alignment. So what are we in alignment with? I believe at the very foundation of everything we do that we must be in alignment with the Word of God. The Word of God is the foundation for everything we'll talk about this summer. If we are not in alignment with the Word of God, we will start to follow trends and go over this way. If we are not in alignment with the Word of God, we will start to listen to the popular opinions of society and go over this way. And we will get all kinds of pressures and all kinds of hits, but we will be so far from what God wants to establish in our lives and the path that He wants to take us in, we must be centrally aligned to the Word of God. That's our first value, complete alignment where the Word of God is foundational. I want you to look up at the screen or turn your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3. And we're going to look at verses, 13, sorry, verses 12 to chapter 4, verse 4. Only a few verses. And Paul's talking to young Timothy and he says, In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ, Jesus, will be persecuted. While evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned. And have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scriptures God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Then it goes on to say, In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Paul sets the stage for this young Timothy. And he says, hey, there's coming a point when society 
and even people within the church will get out of alignment. They will become misaligned in their beliefs and their actions. And in chapter 3, verse 13, he says there will be people who will seek out to teach deceptive ideas, deceptive concepts, things that look like they're really good, but they are not in alignment with the Scriptures. And then he says in the same verse that there will be people who are evil who will actually go after those things. Because, friends, there are people who just don't want to hear truth. They just want to hear what's appealing to them. And that there will come a point when people who, in the core of who they are, they may look nice on the outside, but in the core of who they are will have an evil element that they are allowing to rule, and they will chase after the things that are deceptive. And then in chapter 4, verse 3, he goes on and he says that there will be people who will refuse to align themselves to the Word of God, and they will actually seek out people who will teach them things they want to hear. They won't like preaching people who preach from the scriptures. They won't be interested in in churches that are are biblically central. They want to to catch on to the latest fad, the things that make them feel good. They'll chase after that. They will come out of alignment. And he sets the stage for Timothy, and he says, Timothy, you've got to understand that the word of God must be foundational in all you do. It must be central. It must be at the core of your life. And church, this morning I want to say that the Word of God must be central for this church and not just from this stage, but for your life. For your life. And so what does it mean to be in alignment with the Word of God? The first thing I think that we see in this passage is that we have got, we've got to live the Word. Live out the Word. Paul says to Timothy, I want you to continue in the things that you have become convinced of because of those that you trusted who taught you. I want you to continue in the things that you've become convinced of because of those that you trusted. What he's saying is, hey, 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 Timothy, I want you to abide or to live in the things that you have come to say, this is truth. This is, this is what truth is because your mother and your grandmother, people that you trusted, they've been putting it into you since the day you were born. They've been putting the word into you since the day you were born. I want you to continue in these things. Now, what's so important in this passage is that Paul doesn't just say, I want you to continue to believe, but he uses this word in the Greek, which means abide. This word continue is actually to abide. And to abide in the word is not just to to sit in your Bible. We we understand that's just foolishness. It's not just about having belief system. And friends, it's not about the mystical elements of this book. I remember doing a retreat one time. I won't tell you where I was. And at the end of the Saturday night, this, this young lady started to manifest demonic possession. I'm not trying to freak you out if you're a visitor, but we do. If you read through the New Testament, you'll see that there are, there's a spiritual realm. And there is this, and the Bible talks about bad the bad spiritual realm about fallen angels and demons and so this girl was manifesting that she was demon possessed and, and i remember we start to pray for her and there was a bunch of people who kind of got freaked out so they left and so so this girl is sitting down we've been praying for her and, and I, i'm just kind of kneeling there and i'm just i'm just talking to her and i'm praying and i'm, and I'm using jesus name and i remember just being in this position and i hear over my shoulder this guy yell out use the word i'm thinking what do you think i'm doing and he says again, use the word. I was like, yeah, 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 okay. A couple seconds later, he comes over to me and he puts a Bible in my hand. He says, use the word. I was like, okay. And I put the Bible down beside me and I continue to pray. He says, put the Bible on her forehead. Now friends, I believe the word of God's powerful. But I don't think the leather and the paper is going to burn the demons out of her head. Out of her body, I mean, he has watched way too much Hollywood. <laughs> to abide in the word is not, is, there's no power in the leather, there's no power in the print, there's no power in the paper, there's no power in the digital elements. The power isn't even in your belief system, the power is in what you live out. The abiding is in living it out. You've got to live it out. I, I, want, you, I want you to imagine this. I, I, I've got this chair here. It's, it's a pretty comfy chair. And, and as I'm young, my, 
my mom and, and my grandmother and some, and some religious people in my life, some people who I trust, people of faith, people who know the ways of health, they say to me, Jeff, that's the chair that you need for good support for your back. Jeff, that's the chair that you need so that you have, you have the best comfort. And they begin to talk to me all about the chair. And from a very young age, they expose me to the chair. They talk about the chair. They talk about the, the dynamics of how this thing is arched. They talk about the, the materials that are inside. They g- give me all the details about this chair. They, they remind me. They remind me of what, to, what it compares to. This crummy yellow chair right here. It's so hard and breaks all the time. And they teach me in it. And so then it comes to a point where I, I'm a little bit older and I've heard enough about the chair from my friends and pe- people I trust. I start to investigate the chair for myself. I start to, to wrestle with the things that have, have been told to me. And I, I sit down in the chair and I think to myself, this is a pretty comfy chair. I, I feel the support in the back and go, you know what, I really like this. It may not look comfortable, but it feels comfortable. I, I feel like it's good for my back. It's got nice support in the, in the lower part of my back and, and, and allows my, my upper shoulders to just have a little bit of movement. This is pretty good. And I begin, to, I begin to look into it for myself. And then I go to the chair library. And I begin to study the way of the chair. And, and, I, and, I, and I determine that, that this chair right here is not very good for my, my back. It's not very good for comfort. And it may be fine for about two minutes. But long term, this is the, the chair that I need to be sitting in. And one day, I, I have determined that I am now a comfortable chair sitter. I, I, I follow the way of the comfy chair. And I, I've, I've come home from softball on a Wednesday night, and I'm tired, and I've just had a shower and, and thrown on some clothes, and I just want to sit for a few moments. And I walk into a room, and I see these two chairs. I see the comfy chair, and I see this chair, and I put my belief system here, and I say, this is what I believe in, but I walk over here, and I choose to sit right in this chair. You come along to me and say, I don't understand. You say that you... You believe in this chair. Oh, I believe in that chair. I can tell you all the reasons why that chair is the best chair. I can give you the history of that chair. I can tell you all the the health issues about this chair, about why it's the the best chair. So why don't you sit? No, no, I just, I'd rather, I just, just, my preference today is to sit in this chair. The next day, same thing. And I keep sitting in this chair. You see, it doesn't matter what I believe or what I state about this chair. If I don't live out what I believe, that all my beliefs are meaningless. And when Paul says to you that you are to abide in the word of God, please listen to me for a second. I don't care what you believe. I do. (laughs) I don't this place is whack. No, no. I do care. But it's secondary because if, if you have all the right doctrine but never sit in the chair, if you, if you can quote scriptures to me, if you can tell me what a Christian should be doing, if you proclaim that you believe all these things, but you keep sitting in the yellow chair, you never live out what you believe, then all you have is theory. And Paul is saying to Timothy, I want you to abide in the the truth. I want you to abide in the word. I want you to continue it. Don't just think it. Don't just say you believe it. I want you to live it out. When, God said, when, the, when the scriptures tell us that God is holy, we must be holy too, friends. That means we've got to live it out. It's, not, it's, it, it's okay to believe it, but if you never live it out, all you've got is theory in your head. The Bible tells us in Matthew 28, 19, and 20 that we're to go into all the world and make disciples, teaching them and baptizing them in the name of Jesus. We all would say, oh, we believe this, but if we never do it, then all we do is sit in the yellow chair. We're not abiding in the Word. The Bible tells us about the things that we should allow into our minds, Philippians 4, verse 8. But when we turn on the TV, if we, if we don't align ourselves with the Word of God, we have a belief system that we declare, but we simply live over here. You see, if we're going to be biblically central, we can't just be doctrinally correct. We've got to be living out our doctrine and our belief systems. To, to abide in the word of God means that's where you live. And, it, and church, my prayer is that not just from this platform, but from the pews out to your homes and to your workplaces, that the place you live is in the word of God. The world doesn't want to hear about your comfy chair if you sit in the yellow chair. 
You have got to align your living up with your believing. Let's look at this verse. It says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. When you say that you believe in the word, but you sit somewhere else, you're deceiving yourselves. You're telling people something that's not true. You may mentally affirm something, but if your life doesn't live up to it, then there's a problem. I, I want you to imagine this just really quickly. You, you, you've bought a house. It's the place where you, you live. One day someone comes to you and says, hey, why don't, you, why don't you hang out at my place today? So you say, okay, no problem. You go over to your friends and you hang out. The conversation's going great. You're having coffee. It gets late. Your friend says to you, hey, why don't you just sleep over? You know, it's, it's only a 10-minute drive, but just sleep over tonight. Yeah, that's probably a good idea. It's really late. Don't want to drive at nighttime. You sleep over. Next day, you start talking to your friend, and, and you get talking more, and your, your friend says, hey, why don't you sleep over again? We, we can do a few more things tonight. We'll watch a movie. We'll, we'll, we'll have some more coffee and talk about, about the issues that we've been talking about. Why don't we go by your place and get some of your clothes so that you can stay over again? And you go, Okay. We'll do that. Day after day, you spend more time at the other house. You start to bring your books over to this place. You start to bring some, some of your more clothes over to this place. You start to bring over some of your prized possessions to this place. After a little while, you realize that you have a place of residence, a place you own, but the place you dwell is in somebody else's home. I want to tell you that there's a danger in the church of owning a set of beliefs but living somewhere else. It's pretty quiet here this morning. But we say we have a set of beliefs and it's our residence, but the place we abide is somewhere else. We, we have a home that talks about holiness, but we live in a place of unholiness. We have a place that talks about caring for the body of believers, but we live in another place that doesn't care for the body of believers. We live in a place that talks about sharing our faith, but we live in another place that doesn't share our faith. We live in a place that talks about praying without ceasing, but we live in another place that prayer is just optional. We have a residence, but we abide somewhere else. And if we are to be a, cent a church that's, that's centered on the Word of God, that's aligned with the Word of God, we've got to live out the Word of God, not just believe it. We've got to live it out. Number two, not only are we to live out the Word of God, but we have got to know the Word of God. Paul says to Timothy, you have known from a young age. This word known means to see with a bridge to the mental and spiritual sight. A bridge to the mental and spiritual sight. It's about perception. You see, Timothy was taught from a young age the scriptures. As soon as he was old enough, he was, he was allowed to read the scriptures and, and memorize the scriptures, and he would look into the scriptures, and, and then he'd have to come to a point where he'd have to look at the, the scriptures himself and just say, is this truth? It'd have to bridge into his mind and into his heart to see if there was a bridge that would connect the dots. Knowing the word, friends, has two components. The first component is that you've actually got to read it. You've got to read it. Or listen to it on MP3. <laughs> you, you, you've got to read the Word of God. You, this idea of knowing, you can't know it unless you see it. I remember this, this one day when I was youth pastoring. There was, there was a book I had ordered. I asked my senior pastor if we could do it, if we could order this book. And it was a book on, on legalities within the church world. And I, I, I've said to people, if I was not a pastor, I probably would pursue the path of a lawyer. I love law. And so I was so excited when this, this law book went, came in. And so I started flipping through it and read a few sections. What, one day we were in our youth service, just a short time afterwards, and I had this young man in our youth group who was very problematic. And, and he was sitting in one spot and he was causing all kinds of problems. I mean, it was an incredible distraction in our worship. So I walked over to him and I said, hey, you need to move. Come on over here and you're going to sit over here. So he was so angry with me, and he, he just reluctantly got up, and he made a big huff and puff and walked over, sat in his seat. So I thought, okay, everything's good. A couple minutes later, the guy that had, had been sitting beside him walks over and sits beside him, uh, right beside him. And so they start talking, causing commotion. So I, I'm frustrated, trying to keep my patience. Walk over to the first guy again, tap him on the shoulder, say, okay, come on, it's time to move. Move him over to this side of the youth room. Sat him there by himself. A few moments later, this guy walks back over to this spot. More problems. 
So I, now it's the third time I walk over and I tap him on the shoulder. And this guy jumps up and he is angry. And he storms out of the, the, the youth room. So the worship is going on. Presence of God's overwhelming, right? I mean, chaos and anger. It's just a perfect atmosphere for God to move. And, and so, so I slip out of the youth room, let the worship continue, go out to, the, out to the, the area outside of our youth room. And this guy's angry with me. And I said, what's your problem? He says, you have no right to tell me where to sit. This is a public place of worship. You have no right to tell me where I'm allowed to sit. And I smiled. And I said, actually, I do. In fact, I'll go get the law book if you would like. And I had just read exactly what my rights are, just in case you want to know. Our ushers have the ability to sit you wherever they want, and if they feel that you're not in a good spot, they can move you. Now, we don't do that, but if you were problematic, we might move you, and we have every right to do that. And since I don't have ushers in my youth ministry, I am the usher, head usher, assistant head usher. I am I'm it. And I had just read it, and so I knew exactly what I was able to do because I had looked into the book. Friends, you will never know truth if you don't get into the book. You will never know truth if you don't get into the Word. Now, now everybody in this place would say, absolutely, Pastor Jeff. Amen. We believe it. We, this, is, this is too simple. In 2013, the EFC did a study about Bible engagement throughout Canada. It discovered that 68% of Christians would say that they, or sorry, 68% of Canadians would say that they are a Christian of some fashion. Surprising to me that it's that high, but 68%. Only 11% of those Christians read the Bible about once a month. 11%. That means that, that 89% read the Bible less than one time a month. So friends, I don't know what the stats are in this church, and I, and I don't want to be derogatory or anything like that. But my guess is, my guess is, is that we need to up our Bible engagement in this place. Younger generation, if you're listening to me, I know reading may not be cool. But you will never know the truth unless you get into the truth. You will never know it unless you get into it. Adults, listen to me. As great as Netflix is, that won't teach you the truth. You have got to get into the Word of God. And, and, and you might have all kinds of questions about, well, how, what do I do? I, I recommend that you go to uversion.com online. Uh, I think I'll talk about it right at the end, but uversion.com, it has all kinds of uh, Bibles, uh, translations, and it has Bible reading guides, but you've got to get into it. You've got to, you will never know the truth unless you get into the truth. It's got to be part of our daily life. Number two, not only is knowing the word about getting into it, about reading it, but number two, it's about understanding it. Understanding. It's about perception. You, you see, there are times that you've probably been taught that you need to read your Bible regularly. And, and that's fantastic. But I don't know about you, but there are some passages of the Bible that I just don't get. Is there anybody who's with me on this? And, and those of you who don't have your hands on, I just, I'm going to call you to the front afterwards for lying because I know that, 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 that everybody in this place... I'm, I'm, listen, I, I went to Bible college. I studied Greek. I, I, I mean, I, I think I know. I, I love academics. I love reading. And there are times where I look at the Bible and go, what is that about? And I hate it when my family asks me something because I'm the pastor. I'm the Bible college graduate. I'm supposed to know. And there are times... I don't know if they know, but they probably do. I'm making it up. I just, I just don't know. I just don't know. It's, it's, it's one thing to, to read it, but you've got to understand it. Let, let me give you an example. Uh, just up on the screen, Ma Matthew chapter 18. I think we have, have this. Matthew 18, verse 20. Where two or three come together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Now, I've used this passage, so if you've used it recently, please don't be offended. Like, I'm, I'm mocking you. Uh, I'm mocking me. I've used this. I've heard about this my entire life. That where two or three people are gathered, there is God in the midst of them. And it becomes this very spiritual moment that, that you just have two or three people together, and it's just like, oh, God's there. The problem is, is that that doesn't line up with my theology completely. Because I don't need another person for God to be there. The Holy Spirit lives in me. So what in the world is this verse about? 
It, like, like if I just if I need to, if I need Ainsley to pray with me and and Pastor Nick to pray with me for God to show up, then man, there there are so many moments in my life I'm in trouble. And the context of this passage, if you read right through it, is that Jesus is teaching about how to deal with conflict and issues. And those who were Jewish of that time would have understood that when two or three people came together for issues of conflict, they represented God's judicial board. And what Jesus was saying is that if you will follow the path that he's laying out when it comes to conflict, and you come to a place where you need a conclusion, that when two or three people are there making the verdict on the issue, it's as if God were there giving the issue himself. This is a legal verse. But for so long we use this verse, for so many years, so many, and, and even today people, people use this verse out of context. You see, it's not just about reading the Bible, it's about understanding the Bible. And friends, I want to encourage you that if you struggle with reading the Bible, that you would get a good Bible commentary. A, a full Bible commentary, there, there are all kinds of, I know this sounds so simple, but I hear verses all the time that are taken out of context in this place. And we are not just to know truth, we're to understand truth. We need the things that we're seeing to come into our head and into our heart so that we might be guided and be in proper alignment with what God has. Get a good Bible commentary. Get some good books. Ask a pastor. Ask a teacher. Ask a friend. Study the Word. Get into it. You don't need to understand every part of it today, but just a little bit at a time. Read and understand it. We've got to live the Word. We've got to know the Word. And lastly, friends, we've got to declare the word. Declare the word. Paul says to Timothy, preach the word. Preach the word. Now, I want, I want to lay out the picture to you. Because most people think this is just solely for, for Pastor Timothy. Okay, this is for Pastor Jeff. This, this is for him. But I, I want you to understand that this is for all of us to declare the word. Paul lays out this picture and he says this. He says, God's going to judge everybody. That's the, that's the, the, the front end of the the book ends. God's going to judge everybody, everybody. Every one of us are going to be judged someday. Just want you to be encouraged today. God's going to judge everyone. And then, he, and then the back end, the other book end, he says this. He says that people will become intolerant of truth. They, they will go through the process of hearing. They will listen to truth. They will consider it, and they won't like it, so they will reject it. And he says this. Hey, Timothy, you know that people are going to be judged by God, and you know you're going to have problems with people who are not going to buy into what you're teaching. He says, but I want you to declare truth because you've got to prepare these people regardless whether or not they're willing to accept it. I want you to prepare them for the day that God's going to judge them. The declaration of truth is a preparation for people to be ready for the day that God's going to judge them. You need to understand this. The truth that you disseminate out there in the public is your preparation for people for the day they meet God. Now, now, now listen to me for a second. Paul gives us some guidance. He, he says that we're to use, <laughs> he says that we're to use uh, great patience, which means it doesn't come from anger, and we're to use careful instructions, methodical teaching. You're not going to teach your neighbor who's unsaved about the ways of God just like this when they don't even believe God or the scriptures. You're going to have to walk them along and be very patient and be methodical in what you present at what given time. I love the great patience part because it means that you don't do it in anger. You know, maybe you, you meet somebody who, who's living with somebody, and, you go, and you, you go, man, that's adultery. And so you see them, and you go, I'm going to declare the word. Pastor Jeff says we're supposed to declare the word. Hey, pagan, you two shacking up? You are bound for hell, and you just give it to them. Now, now friends, I know you're la some of you are laughing, but I've met Christians like that. I mean, they are so full of anger, anger. The good news. No, they're full of the bad news. They, they, they're, they're the ones who are championing. The, You're going to hell. Ah! Great patience is not full of anger. This, this incredible peace and joy. You're declaring truth with great patience, not motivated by anger. And methodically, great truth. He says to present truth to one another. And so every day... Every day you have opportunities with other Christians to declare truth. Every day you have the opportunity to wisely declare truth in the environments that you're in. To prepare people for the day that they have to be judged by God. And Paul lays out three things that we're to do with regards to declaration. 
He says, first of all, we're to correct people. This idea of correcting people is the idea of convincing them based upon a convincing argument. And, and it's not, I don't mean that you, that you get into an argument with people. But there may be somebody right here that you, that you see needs a little bit of course correction, getting back into alignment with the Word of God. And, and you, you want to prepare them just in case Jesus comes back, because we believe he's, that he can come back at any point. You want to prepare them for that day, and so you sit down with them and say, hey, I want to just talk to you for a few moments. Can we, can we just look into the Word of God? Anybody who's had a conflict with me, uh, 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 you almost always will look into the Word of God with me. This is how we deal with things, the Word of God. Let's go to the Word of God, and, and have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? And you lead them through a bunch of premises to a place where they can land on a conclusion. You're bringing correction to improper living and beliefs. Correction, you declare through correction. Number two is to rebuke. Now listen, rebuking is not to go forth and just like saying those words. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I've met people like this. I mean, I've grown up in Pentecostal church my entire life. There are people who are good at rebuking. They think it's a spiritual gift. I rebuke you for this. I rebuke I remember getting rebuked for, for wearing ripped up running shoes when I was eight years old. We didn't have any money, didn't have any other shoes. I could have not wore them to church, but I would have been in my bare feet. Rebuke you for wearing torn up running shoes. This word rebuke is to provide warning about what could happen if they continue in the path. And there are times that you need to sit down with other Christians or sit down with people and pull out the word and say, hey, I just want to warn you. I'm seeing some things in your life that if you continue in this path, if you continue in this way, I'm gonna, you're going to start to see a misalignment. The rebuke is not a harsh thing. It's not a mean thing. It's not an angry thing. But it's a declaration of truth that's preparing people to stay away from the disaster that's up ahead. That's rebuking. And then Paul says that we're called to encourage one another. And this word is to come alongside. I love it that we're to take the word of God and we're to constantly speak truth. When people are feeling defeated, we speak truth in their life that lifts them up. When people are hearing the lies of the enemy, we speak truth in their life and it lifts them up. You see, one of your great goals is to declare truth if, as, as, as a church that's focused on the word of God. We're constantly in each other's life. And when people are down, when people are defeated, when the enemy is kicking us, that someone steps in and goes, let me just speak truth to your life. This is what the word of God says. And you pull them out of that bad place to correct, to rebuke, and to encourage another individual. We must declare truth if we're going to be a centrally aligned church. Pastor Nick, would you come here just as we conclude this morning? And Pastor Steve, maybe you could come back to the keyboard just for a moment, or back to the guitar for just a moment. Paul says to young Timothy, <laughs> that was good, that was good. Paul says to young Timothy, Hey, it's going to get bad. And friends, I want you to know that as society goes on, I will preach some things in this state, on this stage that you're not going to like. I promise you. Because I'm not actually here to make you happy. I'm here to make you healthy. And there, there are going to be some things that will ride in the face of society's teachings. But we're not a church that goes with the, the misalignments of society. The misalign misalignments of trendy thoughts. We're a church that's going to be central on the Word of God. It's, it's, we're going to be completely aligned to the Word. And so the Word of God is center right here. And, 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 and Paul's saying to Timothy, he says, there's going to be a point where there's going to be all kinds of pressures upon you, Timothy. There's going to be all kinds of pressures on you, Christians, where people are going to try to pull you over here to pull you out of alignment. Get back to the Word. But there's going to be times you're going to be pushed by society. You need to live over here in trends. You need to get back to the Word. There's times where someone's going to hit you hard and they're going to knock you over, over to a different side and you need to get back to the Word. Paul is saying that no matter what pressure comes your way, if you will stay with the Word of God central in your life, that you will be okay. You'll be okay. We've got to make the Word of God central. The Word of God can't be a book that sits on your bookshelf with dust. 
or an app on your iPad that never gets opened. The Word of God has got to be central to our lives. And it will be the foundation of everything we speak about in this church. It must be the foundation of everything you do in your life. The Word of God must be central. Complete alignment. Live the Word. Know the Word. Both reading and understanding. And declare the Word. Correction, rebuke, and encouragement with great patience and methodical teaching. And friends, if you will do those things, you'll steer your life right towards the things that God's got for you. You won't need to be pulling constantly. You'll just keep, keep your eyes focused on what Jesus has. That's the church that you're part of. That's what this church is. The Word of God will always be central. And, and I, I want you to know that that has to be the truth for your home. It has to be the truth for your personal lives. The Word of God can't be optional. It must be foundational to everything you do. Would you stand with me this morning? I want you just to bow your heads in a sec. We're going we're gonna to sing one song. I'm going to tell you something in just one moment. But I want you to bow your heads, close your eyes just for one second. Every Sunday I do this. You, you've come into this place and you'd say, Hey, Pastor, I, I don't know Jesus. I don't know the God that you're talking about or even the Scriptures. I'm here today to tell you that Jesus Christ died on the cross so that you might be in relationship with Him. And He wants to begin a journey with you today. He wants to begin a journey with you today where you would come to know him. You'd say, but pastor, I, you don't know the stuff I've done. You don't know how far away from God I feel. But as I read the Bible, this is what I discover. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever would believe in him wouldn't perish, but have eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And Jesus made a way for you to come back into relationship with God. You've never given your life to Jesus, but you'd like to do that today. Would you just raise your hand? Is there anybody in this place? Just raise it really quick. Say, I've never given my life to Jesus, but I'd like to do that today. I'm not going to prolong this, but if you're here today, just wave, wave at me. No one's looking around. Just you and me. All right. If you didn't raise your hand, but you want to know a little bit more, Pastor Nick is at the back. He's, he's uh, on the west side of the auditorium. I'm going to invite our altar team, our prayer team, just to come to the front, if you could make your way right now. And as we conclude this service, I'm wanna, I want to share just a couple things. First of all, if you need prayer, the prayer team's here. They'll pray for you. Maybe you've got a physical need. Maybe you have a financial situation or a marriage situation or, or just a personal difficulty. They're here to pray for you because we believe that God answers prayers. Secondly, in just a moment, we're going to conclude the service, but in your bulletin, I believe, is a 30-day challenge to go through the book of Psalms. It's all laid out for you. This is my encouragement. Sorry, the ushers, sorry, the ushers have this. So they're gonna, it's not in your bulletin. They're going to hand this out right at the, at the very end. I'm asking you to grab this sheet of paper and, and, and not to walk out of this place and say, hey, I, I don't read my Bible or I haven't been taking the Word of God seriously. I don't want you to beat yourself up. But I'm asking you to take that page. And today would begin the beginning of a new journey where you'd say, I choose to be centrally aligned with the Word of God. And I'm going to do the next three days, I'm going to form a habit in my life where I begin to get into the Word. I'm going to start with Psalms, go, follow the layout. And then I'm going to see what God does from there. Some of you may cho choose to go through version, which has all kinds of Bible plans. I'm, I'm reading through the one-year Bible right now. But I'd encourage you, begin today. We're going we're gonna to conclude in prayer. And then as you leave and grab your sheet of paper, we have birthday cake for Canada in the foyer. And I encourage you to stick around and have cake with us today. So let's pray. Jesus, we thank you so much for the word. We thank you that the word is central to our lives. There are times I'm discouraged and I go to your word and it brings me life. There are times I'm confused and I go to your word and I, I find wisdom. There are times where I don't know what to do and I just look into the word and you start to show me things from people's lives and principles of scripture and life comes to me. And I pray that this church would be a church that lives the word, that reads the word, knows it fully. And God, that we be a church that declares the word wherever we go. Let this church be in alignment with what's best for our lives, not be what's best for society. 
I thank you for this congregation. I pray that you'd bless them now for the remainder of this weekend. In Jesus' name.